There are four basic reasons why you may encounter an abnormal opacity in the lung. This talk is going to focus on consolidation. When you're interpreting consolidation, it's helpful to divide your approach based upon the time frame of the consolidation and its distribution within the lungs. We're going to be talking about the approach to chronic non-diffuse consolidation in this talk. And as a reminder, we're going to use four to eight weeks as the threshold between acute versus chronic um, in this kind of um, definition. Um, in some reads, we're going to be fortunate enough to have a prior um, study that informs us whether we're dealing with an acute or chronic consolidation. Um, but there are going to be times where we don't have that. And we may rely on things like architectural distortion to perhaps bias us one way or the other. Um, there'll also just be times where we just won't be sure um, because we have no prior imaging, whether we're truly dealing with an acute or chronic non-diffuse consolidative process. And in that event, our differential diagnosis may have to expand to include possibilities from both buckets. The differential diagnosis for chronic non-diffuse consolidation is fortunately pretty limited. Um, and um, they tend to occur less often than acute non-diffuse consolidation. When we try to construct the differential diagnosis for acute, for chronic uh, non-diffuse consolidation, the differential diagnosis for acute non-diffuse consolidation is a good place to start. Uh, are there going to be things we can borrow from this differential diagnosis uh, for our chronic non-diffuse consolidation differential diagnosis? Well, if we look at this list, um, we can see that the entities um, in the pulmonary edema category um, are all entities that play out on an acute time frame. So those will be unlikely to be things we'll be considering for a process that just grinds on for weeks, if not months. The same can be said about this um, diagnosis within the alveolar hemorrhage category. Um, these are unlikely to play out um, continuously over weeks to months. When we look at lung infections, viral infections are unlikely to play out continuously over a chronic time frame. Um, when we look at bacterial infections, um, mycobacterial infections may. Um, other bacterial infections probably less likely to play out over a chronic time course. Endemic fungal infections, however, can play out over a chronic um, time course. Um, and then if you look really, really hard, um, perhaps um, you'll come across um, two uncommon um, bacteria, nocardia and actinomycosis. Um, those folks are also um, lung infections that can play out chronically. Um, we kind of grade them out a little bit here just because they're more uncommon diagnoses um, than say something like endemic fungal infection or even a mycobacterial infection. There'll be other categories, however, um, that we need to think about that could explain a chronic non-diffuse consolidation. And one of those categories is inflammatory um, disorders. And there's gonna be four diagnoses we want you to be able to remember. Organizing pneumonia, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, which uh, is kind of a twin of organizing pneumonia, but um, much less common. Granulomatosis with polyangiitis, uh, what we used to um, refer to as Wegener's, and then lipoid pneumonia. And rounding out the third category for the chronic non-diffuse consolidative differential are two malignancies, pulmonary lymphoma and adenocarcinomas, um, specifically the more mucinous and lipidic subtypes. Um, both of these malignancies can sometimes manifest as just a kind of non-diffuse consolidation as opposed to a discrete mass. So this is our differential diagnosis 
that we'll have to try to remember when we encounter non-diffuse consolidation that's chronic and not acute. Now let's start doing a, dip, a deeper dive into each of these three categories, starting with lung infections. Most lung infections that we'll encounter uh, resolve in under two months. There's only a couple of infections that can last a long time. A couple are, that are what we refer to as chronic lung infections. If you would take a look at the whole kind of um, uh, list of potential um, respiratory tract infections, it's only these guys that um, are chronic, are organisms that could be responsible for a chronic, non-diffuse, consolidative picture. So you have the actinomycetes, a group of organisms, uh, which contain your mycobacteria, TB and non-tubercular mycobacteria infection, in addition to nocardia and actinomycosis. And then you have endemic fungal infections. So these are going to be the organisms that are, res that are responsible for chronic infections, uh, partly because these are just organisms that the immune system has a really tough time eliminating, but the infections are not so aggressive that they would outright, um, say, kill a, a person um, quickly. Let's uh, discuss each of these um, groups of infections, starting with mycobacterial infections. Mycobacterial infections like tuberculosis and non-tubercular um, mycobacterium um, can present in different ways on uh, imaging. Um, one of those ways is consolidation, specifically focal or multifocal consolidation. Uh, this is an example of one such case in the medial right upper lobe. Endemic fungal infections are also a possible explanation for uh, chronic non-diffuse consolidative lung infection. Um, sharing many of the imaging presentations as mycobacterial infections, including nodules or masses, um, but um, these are known to also present as consolidation, uh, chronic non-diffuse consolidation as well. Um, an example of histoplasmosis and an ex um, example of blasto. Nocardia infections, um, probably a little less common than the other two, um, may sometimes present as chronic non-diffuse consolidation, as can its relative actinomycosis as well. And here's an example of a case of chronic non-diffuse consolidation. So when we encounter chronic non-diffuse consolidation, one of the three categories we need to think about are chronic lung infections endemic fungal, mycobacterial, and if you could remember, nocardia and actinomycosis. The second category of diagnoses we need to really think about are the inflammatory disorders. Organized pneumonia, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, granulomatosis with polyangitis, lipoid pneumonia. A brief digression. This is a list of the kind of things that can irritate, upset, or injure lung. Uh, the lung parenchyma is, after all, a very delicate structure. The things that um, can potentially injure lung fall into three main categories. Drugs, immunologic activity, and inhaled phases of matter. When it comes to drugs, um, both legal and illegal drugs um, have a possibility of irritating or injuring the lung. Um, think chemotherapy, uh, things like methotrexate, think crack cocaine. When it comes to the second group of things that can injure lung, uh, we're thinking about immunologic activity. It's a bit like uh, if you had a huge party at your house, there's bound to be some collateral damage. So um, in terms of 
immunologic um, events that can injure lung, uh, we subdivide those between autoimmune and non-autoimmune um, um, entities. So under autoimmune, things like collagen vascular disease and pulmonary renal syndromes are common. For the non-autoimmune events, um, examples include transfusion reactions. It's just an exuberant response to a viral infection, chronic lung uh, uh, rejection, and people who've had a transplant or bone marrow transplant. In the third category, inhaled phases of matter, um, there are sometimes gases, solid particles, or liquid that we can inhale that might irritate lung. From chemical fumes to organic or inorganic particles to fluids, um, for example, acids, something as simple, simple as gastric um, contents. When we talk about inorganic particles, uh, we may want to split them between the very tiny ones, uh, such as smoke, to the coarser ones. Um, think silica, coal particles. And then there's a, in green here, one final sort of um, uh, category, which is just idiopathic. Uh, possibly um, just um, in the future, we'll learn these are just uh, some sort of either drug, um, immuno event, or inhaled thing with um, perhaps a, a genetic component. But for the current time, uh, we don't really know the cause, and uh, we'll label these, this final group as idiopathic. So these are all the different things that could injure lung, that tends to be things the lung does not like. Along the top here are 10 diseases. Um, we've got two interstitial lung diseases, uh, organized pneumonia and chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, um, and a couple more options as we go from left to right here. Um, these diseases all seem very disparate at times, but one thing that unifies them is these are all lung injury response patterns. So when the lung gets injured, the pathologic response uh, may be one or more than one of these entities on this um, table here. And as we read and learn more about um, lung injury response patterns, we'll eventually fill in this chart and understand, for example, that um, there are certain types of injuries that predispose to certain response patterns more than others. Um, so uh, if you just look at this chart, um, it turns out that um, drug toxicity, for example, um, tends to be um, associated with almost every one of these uh, response patterns. Whereas uh, transfusion reactions tend to result more often in acute lung injury or diffuse alveolar damage, and much less likely the other patterns of uh, lung injury response. So we've already been introduced to a couple of these in the course of our first year um, chest radiology talks. Um, entities like acute lung injury, diffuse alveolar damage, alveolar hemorrhage, and HP have all showed up in our prior talks. And in this talk, we're going to be introducing two more, organized pneumonia and chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. Organizing pneumonia is one of the potential explanations for chronic non-diffuse consolidation that's inflammatory in nature. And before we move on, that term pneumonia um, does not suggest that this is an infection. The actual definition for pneumonia is actually lung inflammation. So certainly infections can cause this, but non-infectious um, entities can also result in lung inflammation or pneumonia. So organizing pneumonia is, as we just alluded to, a pattern of lung injury response to an insult. Those insults tend to be most often reaction to drug, collagen vascular disease, the response to a recent infection, and then there are going to be a number of times where we don't really know what the cause is, and those get labeled as cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, or COP, C-O-P. Organizing pneumonia can present as multifocal, non-diffuse consolidation, 
often playing out over a chronic time frame. The consolidation may not be homogeneous. There may be ground glass involved, either inside or along its margins. And distribution-wise, um, they may kind of have a predilection for the peripheral lung and sometimes the peribronchovascular non-peripheral lung, the areas of the lung around the bronchovascular bundles. If we are an image organizing pneumonia um, from time to time to time, uh, we may observe that the process waxes and wanes. It comes and goes and comes and glow goes, but never quite resolves unless it's been treated. Um, and so that's the kind of uh, behavior we, we expect to see. Some examples of organizing pneumonia. Um, these are all examples of chronic non-diffuse consolidation. This example is in just the lower left lung. We've got an example that's more multifocal, with probably a little bit more of architectural distortion happening in both lungs. Uh, an example from a, a patient with a CT scan, multifocal, um, non-diffuse consolidation, certainly heterogeneous with kind of ground glass components. This one tends to be more uh, non-peripheral peribronchovascular in its distribution um, happens to actually substantially improve once the patient's treated with steroids. Um, some other examples of organizing pneumonia, uh, multifocal, non-diffuse, um, chronic consolidation. Notice that there's a little bit of architectural distortion. Um, look at how slightly distorted that airway is in the left lung in this patient. Um, look at how the lung's architecture looks like it's slightly retracted in the areas where we see these irregularly marginated regions of consolidation. Um, all examples of non-diffuse consolidation caused by organizing pneumonia. Chronic eosinophilic pneumonia um, is another lung injury response pattern um, that may happen to exposure to a drug collagen vascular disease, and sometimes um, idiopathic. The presentation of uh, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, or CEP, is pretty much indistinguishable from the um, presentation of organized pneumonia. So everything we just described with organized pneumonia um, applies to CEP. So any of those um, last couple of cases we looked at could have been easily labeled CEP and no one would know. CP is a twin of the um, twin of organized pneumonia. And so one thing we used to kind of just talk about in conference as residents was whenever um, you know, you're trying to create a differential diagnosis, if organizing pneumonia gets mentioned, always mention CEP. Um, they're indistinguishable on imaging, and you get a free answer if you're asked to generate a differential diagnosis. E examples of CEP, um, what you see in these examples are non-diffuse chronic consolidation. Uh, notice that the consolidation seems to be associated with a little bit more architectural distortion than in many of the acute non-diffuse consolidation examples we shared during the um, earlier talk on acute non-diffuse consolidation. Um, we even have MR examples in this case. Granulomatosis with polyangiitis, what we used to call Wegner's, um, can also um, cause uh, chronic non-diffuse consolidation in some patients. Now, um, when the inflammatory cells involved in granulomatosis with uh, polyangiitis GPA occur, um, different things can happen. Uh, when they invade vessels, um, they could result in a vessel leak that becomes alveolar hemorrhage. When the cells invade the vessels, sometimes they don't cause the vessel to leave, but they cause the vessel to become occluded, which may result in lung necrosis and cavitation. Sometimes when the inflammatory cells invade the lung parenchyma proper, um, this may um, cause a chronic inflammatory kind of um, cascade uh, or a series of events to occur, which lead to the appearance of consolidation. Um, playing out on a more chronic um, scale uh, time frame in a non-diffuse presentation. So um, multifocal consolidation is one of the uh, potential presentations of GPA. Um, oftentimes you may see some ground glass either inside or along the margins of this area of consolidation. And the distribution, uh, much like the distribution that we see with OP and CEP, uh, 
may tend to be the peripheral or non-peripheral peribronchal vascular. And these are some examples of GPA. Um, what you see here is multifocal um, non-diffuse um, consolidation that's chronic in its time scale. The fourth uh, diagnosis we want, to, um, we want you to remember when you think about um, uh, possible explanations for non-diffuse chronic consolidation that's inflammatory and causes uh, lipoid pneumonia, uh, which came up uh, in our specific uh, lung mass talk. There are two forms of lipoid pneumonia, an exogenous form that's uh, triggered by um, aspiration of lipid-rich material, uh, leading to a foreign body to that um, aspirated material. And there's an endogenous form, uh, usually associated with occlusion of a central airway, uh, necrotic parenchyma or secretions that result in lipid-rich material upstream from that occlusion, prompting a similar type of chronic inflammatory uh, response. The presentation of lipoid pneumonia um, is often non-diffuse consolidation. Um, and it usually plays out on a chronic time scale. Most cases are lipid rich and will have areas of internal macroscopic fat, which render these cases to be specific in appearance. Um, some are gonna be lipid poor. Because they're lipid poor, you are not gonna be able to visually pick up macroscopic fat within the area of the lipoid pneumonia. And these will be presenting and worked up as nonspecific consolidation or mass. Um, it's not unusual to see other features, ground glass opacities, for example, um, associated with the consolidation that's caused by the lipoid pneumonia. Um, these tend to be often aggressive um, in terms of um, the inflammation that occurs. Uh, so uh, don't be surprised to see evidence of architectural distortion, fibrosis, even speculation along the margins of the opacity. And the distribution generally favors the dependent lungs, especially for exogenous cases in which the uh, material is probably introduced by aspiration. And here's a, uh, a good example of lipoid pneumonia. What we see here is non-diffuse consolidation that happens to be chronic. So these are the main entities we'd like you to remember if you're entertaining an inflammatory cause for chronic non-diffuse consolidation. Uh, CEPs darkened a little bit because it's not as common a diagnosis as perhaps some of the other things on this list here. We'll round out the third category of potential um, causes of chronic non-diffuse consolidation with the two malignant entities um, in this diagram, pulmonary lymphoma and adenocarcinoma. When we talk about um, the types of adenocarcinoma that are, tend to be somewhat less um, aggressive or invasive than our traditional invasive um, adenocarcinomas that present as nodules and masses, um, these are the ones that at one time referred to as bronchovular carcinoma or BAC. Um, the lipidic and the mucinous subtypes of these adenocarcinomas um, can sometimes closely mimic the look of a kind of a patchy consolidation as opposed to a discrete nozzle or mass and can sometimes be easily mistaken for uh, a lung infection uh, without uh, follow-up imaging to prove that this is a chronic process that doesn't just go away. The majority um, of um, these lower grade adenocarcinomas present generally as subsolid nodules, uh, but in a minority of situations, um, this entity can uh, present as um, focal or multifocal consolidation. And here's a, a good example of a case. Uh, what we see here is consolidation and a large zone of ground glass as well. A little bit of interstitial opacities thrown in. Um, that was chronic in nature and not due to a chronic lung infection, not due to an inflammatory condition, but due to a malignancy, uh, one that looked a lot like lung infection. And here's a more um, um, kind of uh, ex um, exuberant um, um, case of adenocarcinoma, where we see just multifocal 
um, areas of consolidation. Um, again, not caused by chronic lung infection, not caused by one of the inflammatory disorders we called, uh, we discussed earlier, but caused by a malignancy that mimics the look, in fact, of things we were more likely to call chronic lung infection. Pulmonary lymphoma um, sometimes presents of a mass, but sometimes can present as consolidation. Um, one quick point or two. Um, air bronchograms um, in these, and also um, the mucinous and lipidic um, adenocarcinomas. So unlike um, more invasive malignancies that are more likely to kind of uh, occlude or, or cinch off airways, um, you might see patent um, um, airways within the opacity in an adenocarcinoma or a lymphoma in this case. Uh, pulmonary lymphoma um, doesn't usually occur um, at the initial presentation of Hodgkin's, but can occur in the, during the initial presentation of uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, however, when either form recurs, uh, pulmonary lymphoma is a possible manifestation. Um, examples of uh, pulmonary lymphoma uh, untreated and treated. Um, so these guys can present as chronic appearing non-diffuse consolidation. So there you have it. Um, this is the differential diagnosis we'll be responsible for when we encounter non-diffuse consolidation on a, that's playing out on a chronic time scale. Your three categories of um, uh, disorders now are chronic lung infections, inflammatory conditions, and malignancies. For chronic lung infections, first and foremost, I want you to remember, could this thing be endemic fungal? Could it be mycobacterial? Under inflammatory conditions, I want you to remember, could we be dealing with organizing pneumonia? And recall that organizing pneumonia is something that represents a lung injury response pattern that happens sometimes after collagen with collagen vascular disease patients, with drug exposures, sometimes um, after a viral lung infection, and sometimes idiopathic. Consider GPA, or what we used to call Wegner's, and think about lipoid pneumonia, uh, perhaps one of the non-specifically presenting cases. And then for the two malignancies, uh, remember pulmonary lymphoma and adenocarcinomas of the lipidic and mucinous subtypes can present more as non-diffuse consolidation as opposed to a discrete mass. So there you have it. Um, we've now discussed the approach to acute non-diffuse consolidation, acute diffuse consolidation, and with this talk, chronic non-diffuse consolidation. So now we have a hopefully um, a relatively um, uh, practical way of approaching the interpretation of consolidation going forward.